Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful Sunday morning in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I'm Ted Haggard from St. James Church in Colorado Springs. And um, in January of every year, we pass out these little three by five cards and uh, people can ask any question that they want to and uh, or raise any subject that they want to. And um, now I had a guy visiting last Sunday, maybe it was two Sundays ago. And he came up and he said, you know, in our church, we uh, we never mentioned politics. I said, hey, look, I said, uh, this is January. I, I am committed to cover the subjects that they turn in. Most of the time, it's biblical questions and things like that, since this is a church. But sometimes they ask questions about their family. Sometimes they ask questions about political movements. I've been to about half the countries of the world. I've taught in the underground church. I've taught in the suffering church. I've been involved with things all around the world. And so sometimes they're interested in some of my political insights. And it's a little bit different because I uh, I was very pers- in a very personal relationship with Tony Blair when he was prime minister. I know Ariel Sharon and his family before he went home to be with the Lord. And uh, Bibi Netanyahu and I are on a first name basis. And during the George Bush and part of the Bill Clinton administration, I was a pretty regular guest at the White House. And so uh, so sometimes people will ask me about things that may be relevant to that. And here's my thing. The purpose of the church isn't just teaching the Bible. The purpose of the church is to help everybody have a better life. All right. And so sometimes we uh, we have to deal with attachment disorders in a husband or a wife or a child uh, in order to get that family to work. And certainly everybody needs the power of the Holy Spirit. Everybody needs the instruction of Scripture. And that's the foundation. But we also know some other things. It's just like. Is it sinful for a good Christian to have an electrician come to their house since electricity is not covered in the Bible? And um, is it is it sinful for you to go to a physician in order to fight disease? We know from the Bible, God hates disease. There's no disease in heaven. All right. And all the way through Christian history, we've been at war against disease. Even back in the earliest days of the New Testament, he fought disease by having them go outside the camp to go to the bathroom and uh, things like that. There were hand washing things. Now we know that was for the purpose of that wasn't just tradition. It wasn't just an idea. That was in order to clean them up before they ate or before they visited one another in their homes. That was for health. All right. So we've developed some additional things. God is for us in a variety of ways. He establishes civil government for us. He establishes uh, jobs for us and educational. That's how he provides for us. He uh, he provides for us families. He provides for us local churches. He provides for us all kinds of things that are a blessing to us. And you need to know how to act in a local church. And you need to know how to act in a family or you're going to ruin your family. Then you won't have relationships and you're made in the image and likeness of God. And because of that, your greatest satisfaction comes from relationships, not from the other things in life. And so so if you handle your money well and your relationships well and your church life well, you're going to have an extensive set of relationships that will give you a great deal of security and satisfaction. All right. So sometimes those discussions go, they don't, they're never contrary to scripture, but they build upon the foundation of scripture. And so uh, that's important for you to know, because I don't know what the questions are going to be today. All right. And so, so here we go. We'll stir them up and, um, and we will see where we go here. Okay. Uh, Why no altar calls? Okay. For, um, for the first 30 years of my ministry, I gave an altar call every time. Well, and, and and all those years, I was pastoring either, I built three of the largest youth groups in America, or was involved with building them. And uh, so there were thousands of kids at a lot of those meetings. And so we'd give altar calls. Uh, our The church, New Life Church that I built here in Colorado Springs, it got up to 14,000 people. We would give an altar call and lead 50, 60, sometimes Oh, during Easter season and things like that, we'd have three or 400 respond to an altar call. So we would do that and we'd lead them in prayer and, and things like that. 
Uh, but now I pastor a small church. It's called St. James Church. We're in the process of changing its name to North Park Church, and it meets in an office building, and um, uh, it's much more personal, much more intimate, and I I know 99.9% of the people sitting there every Sunday morning, maybe some Sunday mornings, I know all of them. All right, so I can teach them lordship without giving an altar call. Now, Culturally, many believers believe an altar call is a sign of a genuine evangelical church or something like that. I've found if I listen, I've been speaking publicly since I was 16, something like that. And uh, I've had some of the best musicians in the world work for me. And I've had beautiful, beautiful auditoriums that I've spoken in all around the world. And I know how to set the stage so people will come forward and follow me in just about any prayer I lead them in. All right. That's not my goal in life. My goal in life is to get them to make a personal commitment to the Lordship of Christ. My goal in life is to work them through the most difficult times of life because everybody has their own personal temptations and everybody has their own worldview. Everybody's story is different. All right, so what I try to do is get them to the place where they're absolutely convinced that the Bible is the word of God, that Jesus is the son of God, that um, that they need to be born again, they need to be spirit-filled, and as they're born again and spirit-filled, then they start, that walking through the maze of life, trying to apply the Bible as the word of God and Jesus is the son of God and that they are born again people. They're not children of this world. They're children of God. And that by the power of the spirit, they can overcome everything that the world, the devil or the flesh throws at them. All right. Now that only takes 30 or 40 years to walk people through that. All right. So So as we do that in our life, that is not an altar call moment. And 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 um, we fell in love with altar calls because we're products of the Billy Graham generation. And Billy Graham essentially caused the mainstream church world to make a personal commitment to Christ. All right. To enter into a born again personal relationship instead of just a cultural relationship. All right. And so he did that largely through altar calls. Although if somebody had no Christian background and responded to a Billy Graham altar call, the research shows that only four percent of those ended up walking with the Lord. All right. So but then there were experiences like my dad who was a lifelong Presbyterian, United Presbyterian, Presbyter in the Presbyterian Church. He heard Billy Graham on television, made a personal commitment to Christ, and that started his journey of really being committed to the scriptures, then being spirit-filled, then uh, learning about deliverance and, and, and growing in deliverance and teaching all of us about deliverance and living a wonderful spirit-filled life. And so, so I certainly believe in altar calls. I believe in lordship prayers. I believe in giving people an opportunity to come to Christ. But I think the best, the best, the most solid decisions for Christ is when a person walks out of an auditorium or is in an auditorium and they say in their heart, wow, I believe. I believe Jesus is the son of God. I believe the Bible. I commit my life to him. And uh, sometimes somebody needs to lead him in that prayer. But I'll tell you, you get an old farmer in Wisconsin that makes that decision. He doesn't need to talk to anybody. He's just made the decision. It's going to change his life and everybody in his family. And so, so, so there are different ways to get people to make different decisions. Every salesman knows that. But every salesman also knows if you pressure them and if you try to get them to make that decision, well, what do you hear most on the radio today about high pressure decisions. Are there more people selling you timeshares now or people selling you a legal practice that'll get you out of a timeshare? Okay. And it's the legal practice that'll get you out of the timeshare that's all over the radio. Why? It's because they give altar calls. (laughs) All right. So, so everybody, that's why we don't have altar calls when I'm good friends with everybody sitting in the auditorium. Okay. Okay. All right. I don't do that in my living room either. If you come over to visit, I'm not going to give an altar call. (laughs) Okay. Does God limit the amount of suffering he allows 
each of his children to experience. Um, well, God is certainly involved with that. Um, uh, I was reading this morning out of James. Let me see if I can find that here. Um, yeah, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Um, dear brothers, this is a New Living Translation. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. And when your endurance is fully developed, then you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Think of that. All right. So, so yeah, I think suffering has a purpose. I think there is suffering here on the earth. I don't think God is the author of suffering. I don't think, um, it, but he did create a world with us, with him, with the devil, with ideas that are good and bad, with natural law. Natural law causes suffering. Natural law also keeps our feet on the ground and makes it so we can have lights and toilets and, and um, I mean, the study of science has been the study of natural law and how we can benefit from it. And uh, so, so he has set up a situation so they're suffering so that we can make a decision about Christ so that we can spend eternity with him where there is no suffering. And so, so that's kind of the formula. So what we do about suffering, all right, like, all right, let's say you're a, you're a really greedy guy and it causes you to suffer because you don't steal and you don't manipulate people to buy your goods and services. You just offer them. You'll suffer some because you know that if you switched methods, like for instance, in our church, we use offering boxes by the door. Everything you read says, you increase the take of the church 40% if you pass an offering plate. Okay. Now, I we I, I don't mind passing an offering plate. We've done it for years, but with COVID, our crowds went down and it came became kind of like a beggar to have 80 people sitting there and passing an offer offering plate feels very different. And there's at tables now because of social distancing. All right. And so we set that up that way, but when we set it up that way, it felt awkward to take an offering or to receive an offering. So we started using offering boxes at the door. All right. So that's caused suffering. There have been some people who've needed benevolence funds that we didn't have. There have been times when our volunteers that used to get a little stipend don't get it anymore. There have been uh, employees that we've had that needed to go because the income went down. Uh, there, there have been things like that. Our tenants, some of them there, we have 10 tenants in our office building that the church owns and we raised their rent and some of them couldn't do it. And so people have suffered because, uh, b because of that. And so, um, and every, and every one of them had to make a decision then like the volunteers that used to every week get a stipend as a thank you gift because we didn't want it to cost them to buy gas to come to church and volunteer and stuff like that. Um, they've had to suffer some because of it and make a decision. Okay, so suffering does put all of us or inconvenience puts all of us or pain puts all of us in a decision where we have to make tough decisions. And that kind of gets us to our core. And once we get to our core, then we know who we are. And uh, so, so anyway, that that's kind of the way suffering works. Um, uh, you know, the Bible says all things work together for the good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. That's kind of my favorite verse right now. And uh, so, I think we need to know that all things work together and just trust in that. Now, if we cause other people to suffer, that uh, that's not our role. But uh, but we need to be thoughtful about this. OK, uh, one more before we go. Uh, I've come to the conclusion a marriage mentorship plan would be helpful. Any such thing here? No, we don't do a formal men mentorship plan because you know why? The people through the years that I've had volunteered to do a marriage mentorship 
raised lousy kids. And and the the people that would never volunteer to do a marriage mentorship seem to raise great kids. And so if people go to a seminar, they think they know. And I like I like old folks like. All right. So some of you may know that I have a sordid past and um, all those millions of dollars we've put into missions and the thousands of I've led more people to Christ personally in this city than anybody else. And uh, uh, so I've had my good days and my bad days. So Gail and I have been married 43 years. We have five children. They all love me and Gail desperately, deeply. We talk to them all the time. Uh, we have five grandkids. They are absolutely off, uh, awesome. And they love Papa Ted. And they love Miss Gail. I mean, she's so great. Nana, they call her. And um, uh, so we have a great family. We've never been divorced. We've never had an illegitimate child in our family. We've never had uh, bankruptcy in our family. We've never had any of that. And now I'm not saying it's bad if people do. Life is life. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I'm relieved we have it. Okay. Because I know great people that have had horrific things happen in their family and horrific situations with kids and grandkids. Um, and so I don't listen, I'm sympathetic to all of it. I don't judge any of that. I'm just saying we haven't had that. Okay. So uh then I have people who uh judge us and say horrible things about us. And they've been divorced and remarried three or four times. Or their grandkids, they don't know if they're boys or girls, or or what color their hair is, or whether those metal things sticking out of their faces are because of surgery or because they went to the wrong store. And so, so, so listen, folks need to calm down about this thing. Here's the way eldership works. Eldership is when people have lived life well. All right. And once they've lived life well, then you find them in the church and you talk to them. Because every church has people who've done everything well, finances, budgets, education, et cetera. And every church has people who have not done things well. And the way eldership works is you, like, for instance, I've fallen and gotten up. I know how to do that. So if you've fallen and you need to get up, I'm the guy to talk to. And I know more about it than a local therapist lots of times, not all the time. And so, so that whole thing about formal mentor, mentorship programs, that's necessary if you don't know the people in your own church. But if you know the people in your own church and have relationships with them, then you can find them and figure out life and live a better life. Okay, that's enough for today. Uh, boy, oh boy. See, I am so glad the Q&A thing is over because now I can get back to subjects that uh, are more appropriate. Okay. All right. God bless you all. Have a wonderful time.